Cool. All right. Well, I think I will go ahead and get us started. So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, as always, for tuning into our weekly Science Talk webinar series, which we are starting to just wrap up here. Um, today, we're joined by our team of colleagues that are working across two different citizen science initiatives, the Green Infrastructure Rapid Assessment Project, which is led by Dr. Jennifer Cherrier, and the Off the Roof Project, which is led by Dr. Sybil Charbel. So it's my pleasure to introduce our team today. Uh, Jennifer Cherrier is a professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Brooklyn College in the City University of New York. She is also the president and founder of Waterway Ecologics, LLC. Her 27 years of research experience are in aquatic carbon and nitrogen cycling with a more recent focus on water resource sustainability, integrated water management, and nature-based approaches for offsetting urban flooding and human impacts on marine and freshwater systems. Jennifer's research group has developed a novel smart censored hybrid technology, EcoWare, patented in 2017, that augments green infrastructure to, in to control stormwater retention times, maximize pollutant removal efficiencies, and also allows for water storage and reuse. The JIRA project also includes Dr. Alan Berkowitz, who serves as the head of education at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Uh, Dr. Berkowitz is also the director of the UN Undergraduate Research Program, which we're going to hear about next week. So thanks for joining us, Alan. And then Off the Roof will be presented by Dr. Sybil Charvel, a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the director of the Interfuse Graduate Program, as well as the Urban Water Center at Colorado State University. Her interests include water reuse, such as gray water and reclaimed water, integrated urban water management, and waste conversion to energy. Sybil is currently working on development of models to estimate water savings associated with urban water conservation practices. And Dr. Shelvel also has several years of experience working on waste conversion to methane through anaerobic digestion. So I know that Jennifer is going to kick us off today. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen, you can take it away. All right, whoops, <laughs> start at the beginning. Let's see, all right. All right, okay, so um, thanks thanks so much for inviting me and um, then for giving us the chance to talk about our project. Um, so this is uh, the Rapid Assessment and Long-Term Monitoring of Green Stormwater Infrastructure. This is a collaboration uh, by myself, Tom Mixner at the University of Arizona, and of course, Alan at the Cary Institute for Ecosystem Studies. Um, and I'll just get started. So, um, so what was the challenge that we're looking at? Um, well, just like uh, many urban areas, uh, what, what we're looking at is um, trying to ensure urban stormwater resilience. Um, in many urban areas, we have chronic and acute stormwater flooding, and we also have stormwater and combined sewer overflow pollutant loading that is entering our um, receiving water bodies. And just to make this personal, um, these are two pictures near my house, uh, the, the top one with the star, uh, and the cars, that's from a chronic cloudburst event uh, on 4th Avenue, so it's not even a cute storm. And then the bottom one is actually an acute storm for, from Superstorm super Sandy. Let's see, I have all these little things in my way. Um, so I'm trying to uh, advance. I can't find how to advance. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, to address this, so one of the things that we know in uh, many urban areas is that gray infrastructure alone um, is insufficient to address the stormwater challenges that we have. Um, more capacity is needed. So therefore, um, there's been large scale municipal investments in green, infra green stormwater infrastructure, or GS GSI, uh, for enhanced uh, ur urban stormwater resilience. I don't know where my little arrow thing is. Sorry, guys. Um, is the menu switch. bar in your way? Yeah, maybe that's, oh yeah, maybe it's the top one. Let's see if I can move that, sorry. No, I just am not seeing it. I don't know how we I can, it We can much. see your cursor. Yeah, I can see your mouse too. Yeah, I'm just not able to advance the slides. I don't know what's going on. I'm not seeing the little, <laughs> I feel like a Luddite here. Uh, you just click see. on them, you should be fine anywhere. Okay. 
There we go. Thank you. Got it. That works. The arrows aren't there for me. That's what my problem is. All right. So, okay. So despite these large GSI investments, um, however, there's a lack of data on how these systems evolve over time and how they perform um, across large geographic areas. And this paucity of data is due in part to logistical limitations for mounting large scale scientific sampling efforts, which are needed to collect the data, um, such data. So it's this lack of data about the GSI performance that's interfering with the widespread adoption of GSI. And just as a side note, um, uh, city engineers, those that work in gray infrastructure, don't like the fact that the, there's a lot of inconsistencies with this data. So um, the opportunities and the goals then, so the opportunity then is to engage citizen scientists to assess and collecting this needed data. So the goal of our work then was to develop an open source and transferable citizen science program to assess the spatial and temporal performance of the GSI in multiple cities. Um, specifically, what we did was we developed a green infrastructure rapid assessment protocol, which we refer to as JIRA, um, to be used by citizen scientists to assess the physical properties and the capabilities of the GSI. Um, we also developed a small affordable uh, sensor boxes, which we call GI boxes, to determine the long-term in situ GSI function across several rain events. So the team that we worked with then, um, we had a distinctive uh, partnership model for research, uh, and we have all these various people involved. Uh, of course, we have um, myself, uh, Alan, and um, Tom, and our research teams. Of course, we're all part of UN, and we're working together with um, HSBC Bank and their team, as well as the Earthwatch team. And then, of course, we're working with the uh, cities of Vancouver, Toronto, Buffalo, San Francisco, New York, and Chicago, um, and their teams there. So looking at the research team, uh, we kind of did it in two stages. Unfortunately, we lost uh, Brianne after our first year of the project. Um, but in the beginning, we had uh, Brianne, and we also had Jose Pillich, who was serving as our um, postdoc and the coordinator for the project. And then we had Alan and myself and uh, Tom. The second year of the project, uh, I then was leading the team and we hired Allison Downey, who you probably met at some of the UN meetings, um, to serve as the project research scientist. And then um, luckily for us, uh, one of my colleagues at Brooklyn College was able to help us with um, the analysis of all of the in situ um, uh, sensor data that we had, because he had a lot of experience working on um, remote, uh, remote measurements um, in oceanographic systems. So besides the research team, critical to our work was obviously working with this Earthwatch team. Also critical to the work was working with our municipal and NGO partners in each of the cities. And also, um, and not the least of which was important were the HSBC scientists themselves. They formed the um, citizen scientists. And in total, we worked with 334 participants over the two years. So it really took a village to make this project happen. Um, it took the research team, the city partnerships, HBC, citizen scientists, and the Earthward Watch. Um, each of us had our own um, expertise and um, that were brought to the project to make it actually work, and it took all of us to do it. So the research locations for the project. Um, so here's a map. Uh, we worked in six North American cities. Um, all of these cities had locations where there were HSBC banks, because that's where we wanted to work with the citizen scientists. Each of these cities also had combined sewer systems, so we wanted their, them to be some sort of, um, we wanted to be able to compare them across the cities uh, for some of the, for the, for the reasons why they were putting the systems, the GI systems into um, their cities. Uh, all of these cities uh, were using green infrastructure and they had a focus on bioswales. So over the course of the two years, we um, made measurements in a total of 71 bioswales. Um, so here's where Buffalo is located, if you're over on the West Coast. Um, and this is just a picture of the city and uh, an image of one of the bioswales. Here's where Chicago is, again, the city and um, one of the bioswales, the citizen science we're working in. And then my fair city, New York City, you can see it's all very gray. And then us working in a bioswale in Brooklyn. And then San Francisco and um, also Vancouver, I mean, Toronto, and finally Vancouver. Um, so we worked in these cities. We went to them at least twice and sometimes three times. 
So for our research, uh, we had uh, four main research questions. Um, the first was, how does green infrastructure design and maintenance impact stormwater capture and infiltration? The second one was, how do local climate and environmental environment impact bioswale function? Third, how do these factors interact and which factors are most important? And finally, how well do the results from these discrete one-day rapid gyra campaigns that we were carrying out, how, would, how well would they correlate with a longer-term green infrastructure function, which is why we had the um, in-situ sensor boxes in the systems. So um, what uh, data did we collect to answer these questions and what did we have the citizen scientists measure? So we had two different types of sampling. Um, the first were these discrete one-day sampling events where we were using our gyra protocol. Um, and with this gyra protocol, we broke the citizen scientists up into teams. Um, the first team would look at the um, GSI features, so they would measure them, look at the condition of the plants, the aesthetic value, trash, a number of various um, other things. They'd take pictures of it. Uh, and then um, the second thing that they would do that day would be to make discrete measurements for the GSI, GSI function. Um, so for example, um, they would do infiltration measurements, they would um, an, um, do a quick uh, soil analysis using DSA, um, USDA protocols, and then they would also take a core, a soil core, to then send back to Tom's lab for analysis. And I should say that pr prior to them, us putting them off in the field, um, it took um, about a year for us to kind of find our bearing and, and figure out you know how much we needed to prepare them in terms of kind of overviews and lectures before they went out into the field and before we broke them into groups so organizational structure was really critical to this the second type of sampling was the continuous longer term remote sensing and that's with the gi box sensor installation um, so these are simple arduino sensors that cost about 170 dollars each to build Took a while to get them to work right and for the batteries to last and for them to be watertight. Um, they, uh, we were primarily measuring um, soil moisture and we were burying, uh, burying the soil uh, moisture probes at two depths, um, the top one at 10 centimeters and then the deeper one at 20 centimeters. And then we had this um, citizen scientist install the sensor boxes. So what does some of the results from our research look like? Um, so first looking at the GSI features. So I'm gonna split this into looking at GSI, GSI features and then we'll look at the G, GSI function, both the short-term and the long-term. So for the features then, this was um, work that um, Alan was pretty much overseeing for us. Um, uh, to orient you to this slide, um, uh, what we're looking at here are the, are the results from um, the six cities, uh, uh, and this is looking at the bioswale cover. Uh, the brown color that you're seeing is um, bare soil. The black that you're not really seeing too much of is how many rocks were in the system. Uh, dark green is shrubs, uh, lighter green is grass, and the lightest green are herbs. And um, what you can see here is that there was a wide range and variability of bioswale cover in the six cities, um, ranging from bare soils in Buffalo and Chicago, kind of medium soils in New York, um, down to mostly vegetated in San Francisco, Vancouver, and Buffalo. And then um, another thing that we were looking at were um, aesthetic and vegetation features. And so the next two slides are gonna look similar um, uh, the color coded, the, the lighter blue is Buffalo, the orange is Chicago, gray is New York, yellow is San Francisco, dark blue is Toronto, and green is Vancouver. And we've got three figure, three, three bar, sets of bar graphs in this one figure. And then um, we have the uh, rating on the right. Um, so first looking at the aesthetic ranging from one to five, which is beautiful, one is ugly. Um, Weirdly, um, the, the, the buffalo ones were rated as the most beautiful, even though they were the barest. Um, but uh, by and large, most of the citizen scientists thought that they looked pretty good. None of them um, ended up as ugly. ugly. Um, next, we have the plant um, health rating. One is dead, four is um, good. Uh, and uh, only in Chicago, we had the lowest of ratings. Um, the other bioswales had healthy plants in them. The one thing we did find though is that the plants that were in the bioswales were not necessarily the ones that were intended to be in there. 
Um, so that was a bit of a problem the cities need to look at. And then the last one kind of speaks to the maintenance um, and whether they were trimmed or untrimmed. One is no, yes, two is yes. Um, and you can see that um, San Francisco was the best maintained uh, and then Buffalo and um, Chicago were the least maintain maintained. Next, we were looking at the physical features. Um, the one on the left, we have trash. The one on the right is inlet status. Um, one is no trash, two is a lot of trash, and not surprising in New York City, we had the most trash um, placed in the bioswales. New York City is working hard on that so that people can understand what bioswales are needed for. Um, and then the second one is looking at the inlet status to ensure that the water was coming into the system as it should. And um, one would be blocked and three would be open. So you can see that most of the inlets were open. Um, New York was the one that probably had the most blockage and that probably had to do with the trash and other stuff that got washed into them. Um, okay, so now looking at the G GSI function, both the short and the long term. Um, first, starting with the, the short term, the discrete measurements. Uh, what we're looking at here is a series of whisker plots um, uh, that are detailing the bioswale infiltration and the conductivity in the six cities and their same color coding as we saw before. And in each of these boxes, you see two uh, whisker plots. Um, the one on the left is the field measurement, the actual infiltration measurements that the citizen scientists made. And then on the right are the conductivity measurements that Tom did back in the, in the lab. And what we can see in general, um, with the exception of what was going on in Buffalo, um, which has a lot of variability, um, these are representing all of the measurements that were done in the city. So it's all of them together. Um, and so this is the error that we're seeing with this. But by and large, we see a good agreement between um, the measurements that were made in the field versus what was done um, by Tom in the lab. The, hydraulic, the hydrologic uh, functionality um, was strongly influenced by the bioswale age, size, and the initial type of soil. And also I would say, um, you, know, you know, where the water was being collected from, it was getting more hydrocarbon runoff than get self-sealing. Um, and also, uh, of course, this is not a surprise to any of us, but the design criteria and the ongoing maintenance is really key to ensuring the long-term system performance. And so we found a lot of these systems, they were initially installed, but they weren't maintained um, with the exception of the Canadian systems. They were much better maintained than the ones in the US and San Francisco uh, did a really good job too. Okay, um, then finally, just to take a quick look at the, G, uh, the continuous measurements uh, that we had. So um, I'm just gonna show you for two of the cities for Buffalo and also Vancouver. Um, on, the, on the left here, what you're looking at uh, for the top, both the top and the bottom panel, on the left is a, an aerial image of the um, site and the drainage area for each of the bioswales. The black, uh, the black line outline is the drainage area for the bioswales, and then the star is where the bioswale was located. Uh, and these were handed out to the citizen scientists in their pack when they were um, going to be doing the gyro measurements. Um, and then on the right, what we're looking at is a picture of the swale themselves, um, and the blue um, arrows indicate where the inlets for the bioswales are, and then the yellow triangles indicate where the, um, gyro, the GI boxes were um, um, installed. Okay. So um, now looking at the data, uh, so uh, there's um, two different types of panels that we're seeing here. The top panels, which I'll describe in a second, are the sensor measurements, and the ones on the bottom are precipitation measurements for each of the cities um, over the course of when the systems were installed. Uh, and so, and on the right, on the y-axis, uh, we have precipitation in millimeters. And then on the x-axis are the dates. And these are, this is the data for two months of data that was collected by our, by our GI boxes. And you can see on um, both small, uh, small storms and large storms being recorded. So then if we look at the top boxes, which each correspond for the precipitation below that, um, on the left we have Vancouver, on the right we have, I mean, on the left we have Buffalo, on the right we have Vancouver. Um, the, the yellow lines are indicating the sensors that, the soil moisture sensors that were uh, located 20 centimeters below the surface. That's how they were supposed to be. And then the blue ones were for the sensors that were 10 centimeters below the surface. Um, on the right, the um, citizen scientists got the, the sensors mixed, um, but you can still see the data. 
Um, and by and large, what, we, what we're seeing with this is that um, the sensors seem to be able to capture the, um, the larger rain events. Um, so you can see these peaks. So we see this really rapid rise in soil moisture, and then we have gradual release. And there's probably a function of the soils being saturated and so that we can then see these, these next storms that come up. Um, but um, overall, um, we believe that these sensors can be a, um, great tools for measuring the long-term function of these systems. Um, so, uh, and, and they correlate well with these large rain events that we were seeing. And if anybody's interested, we published this in Sustainability. It came out earlier this year. And um, here's the, the link for the publication. I'm happy for you to look at that. The one thing that I'm not really presenting here is the, the data that's in this paper about actually working with the citizen scientists and, and how effective it is for these one day campaigns. Um, so um, you can take a read at that. So what are our next steps? Um, so we all know that water connects and so we want to stay connected. Um, we'll, we're, we're working to continue to find ways to build upon established project partnerships with EarthWatch, HSBC Bank, and also our municipal NGO stakeholders. And we also want to uh, form additional collaborations with the recep respective universities, uh, university partners in each of the cities. It was a little bit funky coming into the cities and working with the, the municipal partners because we knew that they probably had university partners as well. So we don't want to compete with these people, but we would like to, um, you know, bridge our, our work with them. Um, so we're hoping to do more of that. And then finally, um, what we want to do is to expand uh, the Gyra citizen scientist research approach and the GI box sensor systems into more of our UN node cities. And we were working on this before COVID. Um, I know that myself and Tom are wanting to get these systems in in Tucson and New York City, and we're probably a little bit further along working with our partners. I know Chris Swan was going to be working on it in Baltimore, and our team in Atlanta was also interested in it, and I think the Fort Collins people were interested as well. So that's just the start. And so with that, um, these are acknowledgments, a lot of collaborators, and we're very thankful for our funding for this work. And that's it. Great, thank you. Um, we do have time for a couple quick questions and I actually have one. You'll have to forgive my naivety as not an engineer or working in this field at all, but um, what might be any sort of applicability to rain gardens? I know bioswales are have some similarities. I'm just curious for personal yeah. reasons for another project we're doing out of our institute. Yeah, so, so I'm not an engineer either. I'm a biogeochemist, but you know, it's all in a name. So in Florida, they do not want to call them rain gardens because um, it invokes the idea of standing water. And I know that here in New York City, I was working with a developer and he told me he didn't want a blip in wetland in his, on his property. Um, but a bioswell and a rain garden are quite similar. Um, okay. Now New York City has decided to call them rain gardens instead of bioswells because people like the name of a rain garden, sure. um, but they all function pretty much the same. Uh, you know, the passive infiltration kind of, um, uh, they're, 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 they're uh, linerless sponges. So right. um, they're a good start, they're a bright spot and they work really well in some systems, but I think that there's need sometimes for um, more engine, you know, putting a little bit of engineering them so they can boost their function. Sure, great. Thank you. Yeah, I may I may circle back with you and connect you to a colleague here that's just kicking off a big rain garden project. So oh great. We'd love yeah. to hear from them. Yeah. Glenn, do you have a question or a comment? I just uh, presume that the uh, cities, uh, that the appropriate uh, uh, individuals within the cities are aware of these results. Uh, uh, if that is the case, uh, how have they uh, responded? How have they reacted to to these this information? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So we were wrapping up just as COVID was kicking off. Um, and uh, so we did have a meeting with our municipal partners. Uh, gosh, Alan, was that in 2021 in, or 2020? I can't, it's 2020, just a bit of a blur. March, March of 2020. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was, it was, it uh, pivoted, I think it was a little was bit later the, than that. It pivoted to to virtual. It was going to be in person. And yeah, the city people were coming all to together for it, and, and yeah, it, maybe it was in April. It was in the spring of twenty twenty. 
Yeah, Glenn, I, I think though that we need to reach out to our partners again um, so that we can share this data with them because I think they'll find it um, uh, quite interesting. I know in New York City, they want, they want to have more um, monitoring of the GI systems that are put in the ground because the, when, the, um, when the contracts happen, uh, they're like $45,000 for one of these systems, which is a huge amount of money. Um, but a lot of that money has to go towards um, the contractors have to uh, monitor the system's performance for a year. And then after that, all bets are off. So New York City now has um, over 4,000 assets and they're all out there and they're not getting much monitoring. So we really need to engage this and scientists more. Um, so this gyro approach is a really great way to do that. Great. Thanks. All right, you're welcome. And hey, if you get a, a second and you're able to paste the link to that paper in the chat queue, um, that would be great. Sure. Figure sure. out how to make your slides work that way. <laughs> sure, I can do it. I can All do right. it if it's so long as it's, yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Appreciate that. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and transition over to Sybil now. I'm hoping she can go ahead and get her screen shared. Looks like you, you downgraded to one computer now. <laughs> yep, just one computer now. And are you seeing my screen? I can see your screen and see your All slides. Right. So you're ready to go. Awesome. I'm trying to get into presentation mode and it's not doing it. All right, here we go. Looks like this might run a little slow. Do you want to like sing a song or something while we're waiting? I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you sing a song, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me sing. I don't know. Okay. Let's see if I can. All right. It looks like we're good here. Yep. Okay. So thanks everyone for joining today and really nice presentation, Jennifer. I think a lot of um, similarities between our projects. So it's interesting. Um, I'll be talking today about the Off the Roof si Citizen Science Project, and um, I want to go ahead and acknowledge Shimana Al-Jafari, who's the student that worked on this project, and also um, Greg Newman, who is, um, one is the, was one of the PIs in the project that also runs the sitsci.org website. I'll be talking a little bit more about his role and what he did later. Um, so this project was really motivated by our need to gather more data on the microbial quality of roof runoff. We were, I was on a panel, an expert panel um, in 2017 actually, that um, was seeking to develop treatment guidance for um, different source waters and end uses. And, and one of those those source waters that we were looking at was roof runoff. And at that time, there was such a limited data set on pathogen concentrations and human pathogen concentrations in roof runoff that we ended up using some epidemiological models and things to estimate um, uh, how contaminated roof runoff might be with human pathogens and then develop um, treatment targets. So we were really in a place where we are seeking more data on the microbial quality of roof runoff. And as we were seeking that data and, and wanting to get more information on that, it became pretty clear right away why such data sets weren't available. Um, we really have this need for an extensive data set that includes you know, multiple storm events and that takes into account different climate zones that exist throughout the United States and climate regions, as well as possibly roof material um, and seasons that could impact um, microbial quality. So we needed a pretty extensive data set and we needed that data set to kind of expand national coverage in order to gain confidence in any sort of um, national guidance that we may put out there in terms of treatment requirements for roof runoff. And there's there's a strong interest for, for collecting roof runoff. That's That's been clear. People are doing it all over the United States, but um, not just sure about what the treatment requirements should be for different uses, especially um, potable or using it to irrigate food crops or flush toilets and things like that, where there may be um, human exposure involved. So this really was a perfect opportunity for a citizen science project. And so an opportunity came up through a, um, I forgot what those are called at the moment, but there's these, these, these letters that come out from National Science Foundation for calls, um, and it was on citizen science related to water quality. 
And um, this seemed like the perfect time for us to really think about how we could expand the data sets on, on roof runoff quality. Um, this would enable a large number of samples to be collected from dis dis dispersed locations so we could kind of do this national study. And again, if we have citizens working to um, collect the samples, instead of, you know, having one student have to, or, you know, a couple of different students having to go and drive around and do all of this work, it's, it's really impossible to, to get a, a large number of samples. And this also is an important um, topic that's of interest to the public, and this was a um, opportunity for the citizen science component to be a way for the public to just kind of become more educated on use of non-traditional water sources and some of the benefits of that and, and what the risks are. So the, over, the goal of this work was really to engage the citizens in roof runoff um, sampling. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to get rid of my little tabs as well. So the so we wanted to engage them in roof runoff sampling that informs um, public on use of alternative water sources while also collecting this important data set that we really needed to inform um, treatment targets for roof runoff for, for various different end uses where there could be potentially human exposure and especially, you know, if a potable use, um, people could be directly consuming the water. So um, we um, utilize the, the UN um, network in order to form some collaborations and lots of partner universities from UN were engaged with this project. Um, we had sampling in um, actually in Fort Collins, Colorado. It was in, we're from Colorado State University. We also engaged with Tom Meixner and his group in, in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and then also uh, Michael Sukop helped with this project in, in Miami, Florida. And then we had Claire Welty and her team in Baltimore, Maryland. So that gave us a pretty nice geographical um, coverage. It turned out that having these partner institutions in these locations was really crucial to the success of this project. And you know, Jennifer mentioned a little bit about um, wanting to make sure there was collaboration with the university, the local universities that may have already been partnering with the cities. And um, I just wanted to highlight the importance for us here of having these different partner institutions across these these locations. So the participants had a lot of work to do for this project. Um, a lot of the other citizen science projects that people engage in um, are projects where they can maybe go out and look at a rain gauge and collect some data or, you know, maybe count numbers of plants or things like that. Um, this project was fairly extensive. Um, homeowners needed to install these, these um, barrels that you're seeing in this photo. And, um, and we provided them with very extensive instructions on how to do that. So they were provided kits to install these barrels at their homes. So they would have these kits arrive. Everyone had the same barrels that they were installing across the different homes. And then they had written instructions as well as we made videos for all of the different parts of the project. Um, so they did get a good amount of support. And again, um, if they ran into trouble, all of them had these local universities with students that could come and help them with, with various components of the project. So um, they did get to keep these barrels after the end of the project, which I think was a nice kind of carrot at the, if you think about the carrot and stick approach, this was this was a nice reward for the project is that they would then have a functional um, rainwater collection system. Um, so they installed these these barrels, but then, um, so that was kind of extensive, but probably even more extensive was the sampling events. Um, there was a lot of quality assurance and quality control that we needed for this project because we wanted to make sure that any um, microorganisms or pathogens that we were measuring in the roof runoff were actually from the from the roof runoff and not from um, hands of people collecting samples and not from the sample bottles. Um, so the sample bottles would be delivered to the homes, but then they had a very extensive protocol. You can see um, this is Juman I'm wearing gloves um, to collect the sample and they had to stir with a sterilized rod. There were all sorts of things the participants had to do. And um, as always, rain comes when you don't want it to, and it never comes when you do want it to. So it seems like every big rainfall event that would come in every city would be like in the middle of a work week at the worst time of the year, and you're trying to get people to collect all these samples. Um, 
and you know they, when they're coming home from work and having to juggle um, their families and all of those kinds of things. So it was it was a pretty big ask of our participants, um, but there were some things that really enabled success on this project, um, and I'll talk about those. Um, this is Greg Newman's uh, sitsci.org website, and um, this website was a way that we kind of managed the quality assurance and quality control components of the project where the, the homeowners would select um, and answer these various questions about quality assurance and quality control. They, of course, were trained on all these things, but after each sampling event, they needed to um, answer all these questions and then they could submit their sample and the students would come to their homes and pick them up. Um, the really nice thing, you can see some things here like um, there were the QAQC things, but we also had things like how much, um, what was the roof condition? Were there a lot of scattered leaves, branches? Um, did you see dirt and dust? Um, just kind of had them observe some things like that, that again, the, those are information that we would not have necessarily been able to obtain so easily without the, the participation of our um, citizen scientists to, to give us those, those pieces of important information before storm events. Um, this is a summary of the different types of roofs that were studied here, so um, across the different study cities. So we mentioned uh, that seasonality could have been important. We were concerned with the types of roofs that people had and then these different locations and then across, yeah, I already said the seasons. So we had metal roofs, asphalt shingles, rolled roofs, um, slate slash tile, and then concrete. There was only one concrete roof, which was the um, school building that we had studied in Fort Collins. Um, but you can see we have a pretty good mix of different types of roofs here. So again, the, the participants would collect these samples and then the students in each of our study cities that, with our UN partners and collaborators would go out and pick those samples up, um, take them to their lab, and 10 gallons would be filtered to send the samples to the US EPA for measurement of pathogens. And then one liter samples were shipped to Colorado State University where we would run um, general water quality for those. So a um, little bit of work from our um, students at each of these participant um, uh, institutions as well. More than a little bit actually, quite a lot of work. This is a picture of some samples that were all collected from the same event um, on May 29th in Fort Collins. Um, you can see from this that the, the, the quality looks very highly variable across these different samples, um, different turbidity, different kinds of colors, um, all sorts of things. And that's really consistent with the data that we observed in terms of um, water, both chemical water quality and microbial water quality as well. So this is um, the, the actual pathogenic organism. So we focused on protozoa and bacteria and not virus. Um, there's not very much concern with virus, viral pathogens entering um, human viral pathogens, um, well, viral path, viral viruses that are pathogenic to humans um, entering roof runoff because we don't have very many humans running around on roofs. These were all roofs that didn't have human, the presence of humans and um, most roofs that we're thinking about don't have um, human contact um, on them. So we were really more concerned about the um, presence of uh, pathogenic organisms that could be human pathogens that would be sourced from animals but pathogenic to humans. So we have Salmonella, Campylobacter, um, and then uh, species of Giardia and, and Cryptosporidium. And you can see from this data that we have really um, sporadic uh, results here. Um, Salmonella, you could see, came up quite a bit in the Miami sample. So these are telling you both. Um, so when you see any pink at all, that means there was a detection. And then the more red it is, is telling you the larger concentrations. Um, so a lot of our samples were completely absent of, of pathogenic organisms at all. Um, like I said, in, in Miami, we did have this kind of higher frequency that we observed of Salmonella. Um, we think that potentially could have been from lizards and things like that that crawl on roofs there that are not necessarily present in some of our other study areas. Um, but it's it's this kind of thing with roof runoff where um, 
things are very sporadic. And when you get a hit, um, you can have pretty high concentrations of pathogens, but it may be that many many um, in many samples there there aren't detected at all and so that's important from a from a risk perspective so detection frequency we saw 8.8 percent .8 of the samples had salmonella 2.5 percent campylobacter and 5 percent giardia again with those salmonella that was mostly occurring in um in miami um, so these these potentially human infections pathogens were found to be present in roof runoff um, the concentrations are not highly different from typical surface waters that are considered, you know, non-contaminated surface waters in the United States. So that's kind of the concentrations that we're observing in this roof runoff is pretty similar to what you'd see in a lot of um, a lot of our surface water streams and, and rivers and things like that. So um, ultimately, this data has been able to um, inform revised pathogen treatment targets. So um, I talked about that 2017 panel that I was on where we did not have enough data to support um, development of um, regulations for, or not regulations, sorry, treatment targets for roof runoff for different purposes. So um, this is looking at these two different um, water use scenarios um, where we're using roof runoff water for either unrestricted irrigation. And what unrestricted irrigation means is that the water can be sprayed at any time in areas that have high human contact. So maybe, you know, parks or whatever, where you'd have a known presence of, of people during an irrigation event or indoor use like toilet flushing. Um, so like I said, the viral um, pathogens are just not applicable for roof runoff. Um, unless you have human contact on the roof. Um, so parasitic protozoa, we did not even have data to inform a tre treatment target in 2017. Um, and therefore, there was no recommended um, treatment target. Um, so these are log 10 reduction targets. So this is telling you, so a higher number means that you need to remove more of these particular types of, uh, of pathogens for the water to be safe for that end use. So we did find that protozoa existed. Um, the interesting that thing that happened after our 2017 guidance, when we said there was no data available, um, the regulatory community kind of rolled with that and said, okay, we don't need to treat for protozoa necessarily and didn't provide a log reduction target, which is kind of the way that things happen. And so we did determine that protozoa are present in roof runoff and that we need to treat for a small amount of those. So one one log reduction is is not very much, but, but there is um, a potential need for removal of those for safe uses of this water for these different end uses. And for the bacteria, you can see in 2017, we kind of did this um, uh, study of, of seagull fecal material and how much bacteria is present in that and came up with these targets around 3.5. And we're able to revise that to a lower treatment target of 1 and 1.5 for indoor use um, based on this new newly available data. And um, the state of California is now updating their um, on-site water use um, regulations and is making use of these updated log reduction targets. So that's been a really nice outcome of this study. Um, we're working on, we have a paper that's been submitted and accepted with revision to water research um, that includes all these various different authors, many of whom are um, partners on our UN project and that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a really nice infographic that Greg Newman put together on this project that was intended to kind of educate uh, the public on the results of, of the project. And a lot of these are data that I've already talked about and kind of um, tell some of the same things that I just uh, talked about in terms of uh, the detection is infrequent, but concentrations are pretty similar to surface water quality. Um, this one over here on the right, um, Factors predicting chemical and microbiological quality of roof runoff with high confidence could not be found. So despite our best efforts to include all these different seasons, all these different locations, we really couldn't find statistical correlations um, and, and predictors um, based on those different um, characteristics. We looked at things like impervious area, um, overhanging trees, all sorts of things. And there was just no consistent trend that helps us predict 
um, the microbial quality of roof runoff, which means we kind of just have to accept that we need to treat for a small amount of, of bacteria and protozoa for these end uses where a lot of human exposure is possible. So I'm going to do a summary of scientific findings, but then also a summary of some of our citizen science findings. Um, so um, like I've said before, roof runoff physical chemical parameters had um, weak um, yet significant uh, effects on concentration of intercoxide. Um, the fecal indicator bacteria were not significantly correlated to concentrations of pathogens. Um, they, there were some weak correlations found. This is consistent with other studies. Um, so the fecal indicator bacteria just don't do a good job of telling us about the human pathogens. And um, physical chemical parameters and percent impervious area um, were not found to be important factors for prediction of presence or absence of, of pathogenic organisms. So we just, like I said, really could not find good predictors of, of these um, pathogens. Some of the meteorological parameters did look to be good um, predictors, such as rainfall depth and antecedent dry period. Um, we did need some additional data to, to support that further, but um, there did appear to be some things related to that, which could ultimately provide some guidance based on rainfall depths and, and antecedent dry period and, and how those may um, kind of correlate with either more or less um, uh, likelihood of, of pathogenic presence. So moving on to the, to the kind of citizen science lessons learned. Um, we had these barriers, those extensive requirements from participants and also this national scale. But the Urban Water Innovation Network, or UN, really helped to overcome these barriers in many different ways. Um, the, the Having the partner university in each study city became a really crucial factor in the success of this study. Um, having their, the ability of students or faculty that were local being able to answer our participants' questions and having them coordinate with participants to collect samples and things like that. Um, I don't think we ever could have achieved this study without that network and support. Um, there were uh, the, there were extensive requirements for the, the participants, but we had Greg Newman and also Alicia Kroll who helped us to recruit participants that were really excited to be in the project. And that was a huge uh, bridge towards success for us is, is getting participants that were really interested in, in having um, people like Greg Newman and, and Alicia Kroll that had experience, extensive experience in citizen science and um, knew about participant recruitment and these kinds of things that could really support our project. And then further, they helped to um, uh, kind of coordinate participants. They sent out communications to them frequently, let them know about results as they were coming in. Um, and having staff dedicated to just uh, kind of connecting with our, our different participants was also, I think, a really important part of the success of, of our project. Study impacts, I already kind of talked about this. We were able to, to um, um, revise those, those uh, treatment targets. And the most important thing is the, the log reduction targets for bacteria um, were revised to be a little bit lower. So we could be a little bit less conservative than some of our initial assumptions. But we did find that protozoan pathogens are, are really important and we need to include those as part of our treatment schemes for, for roof runoff. So with that, I'll go ahead and take questions. Great, thank you, Sybil. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Any, any questions for Sybil? Sybil, I was curious, oh. uh, in Miami, was it multiple roofs that had those same problems or just one? Or yeah, that's a good question here. Let me just share my screen again. And it's not gonna help that much, but I just like to, be visual when I'm talking about things. So mm -hmm. just kind of bringing up this data again, and I'll pull this up. Um, that was one thing we looked at was we were really interested, was there one roof in particular that was consistently contributing these um, salmonella species? And that was not the case. They were just kind of um, sporadically detected across the different roofs. So I think there were four study locations in um, Miami, if I'm correct, you might even know better, Mike. Um, um, but 
Miguel might know. He's on too. Yeah, that's right. Miguel helped with this project. Thank you for pointing that out. So thank you, Miguel, for your help on this project as well. Um, I'm pretty sure that there were about, there were four um, roofs where there were samples collected and it was not consistently detected in any of those four sites or any of the number of sites that were across. And it was just kind of sporadically detected across the different sites. So um, it was not like one repeat offender. <laughs> it was a, a kind of sporadic and widespread um, occurrence. Interesting. Yeah. Jennifer, go ahead. Yeah, it's great talk, Sybil. That's great. Really interesting. Um, yeah, I didn't talk much about the working with citizen scientists. I can't even imagine. I remember when you were in the middle of it, I, just the just the supply chain or the, the you know, handing off the samples. It's got to be really hard for QAQC. Um, I'm just curious because we spent a lot of time on this and I didn't really speak to it, but it was absolutely critical and it really took a huge shift for us with our EarthWatch team partners to really get them to understand it. We really had to fight hard to make them give us time to be able to prepare the students so that they under, not the students, the citizen science, so they really understood the context of what we were talking about and why, you know, what what the water issue was. And without that, it, it just all kind of fell apart. There was no reason to go out in the field because they didn't know what they were doing. I'm just wondering yeah. if you that we had a very similar situation where, you know, especially because, like I said, you know, we've got to wear the gloves, you've got this, you get this uh, stir rod in this plastic container, and you can't open it before you start sampling, and there's all these rules. It was so expensive what people had to do. Um, we did a webinar that was recorded in advance and during the, the study. We were able, like I said, to get participants that were already really engaged and interested in the topic, but still with that population, we needed to do a lot to make them understand why was it so important that they didn't contaminate the, the sample and why was it important that we were even wanting to know about um, what types of microorganisms are, are in roof runoff. So we had a lot of education and outreach activities. And again, I, I went into this totally blind. It was thanks to Alan Berkowitz who, who said, "Sibley, if you're going to do some citizen science, you need to get you need to get some people who have some experience with citizen science." And that was a game changer for me. Um, I would have I would have completely botched this project if it weren't for the involvement of those those individuals to help with design of the project and and interactions with the participants and telling me things like you've got to educate people on why they, they care about the science so we need to keep them up to speed on the results and all of those kinds of things um, really crucial I think to our success is under having people understand the why yeah absolutely and also having it so clear the direction so absolutely clear it took us a whole year to get the directions together so people could follow it because yeah yeah they've never done it before so that it's kind of like setting up a meeting you think oh i'll just have a meeting and it'll be fine everybody will collect the samples but you really have to you, you have to prepare hard for a good meeting right right and, and yeah yeah that's what we were harder exactly and that's you know we spent we probably spent six months also preparing videos and instruction sheets and then having people that aren't you know, for us, it was easy to read the instructions because we do this kind of work all the time. But people that don't do this kind of work all the time, having them review those and say where they had questions and things like that, it was a really big process. Thanks. Theodore, you have a question. Yes. Well, good afternoon. This is Theodore uh, from Howard. So I have a question. So following the sample, did you use any, like, pathogenic indicator to identify those different microorganisms that you found in the water? Sure. So what we, the way that we um, measured those was through PCR analysis. So it's actually genetic um, detection of those different types of organisms. And we worked with the US EPA labs. They were the ones that ran those um, samples for the different pathogenic organisms. So we didn't do screening. We really went straight to um, kind of uh, the, the molecular techniques of, of PCR, polymerase chain reactions. Yeah. Okay. And, and for the treatment, by what type of method like were they using? Were they 
like did they use like any type of like like surrogate microorganisms to treat the water or did they have like specific you know so these homeowners weren't actually treating the water they were just collecting it and we were then measuring the quality um the idea is that you know if you're if you're gonna if, if people were taking and collecting this water and maybe just taking it to in buckets to an area of their water and using it to irrigate uh, non-food crops, that those types of exposures are not important for roof runoff. And that's probably if people use the water, that would have been how they did it. But the motivation for the study was kind of more, um, let's understand the water quality so that when we can think broader and larger scale systems where we may take roof runoff from a larger area and uh, treat it and spray irrigate in a park where people are playing soccer or whatever, or we may even take it and use it for toilet flushing. So in this project, the participants didn't have treatment set up. And the idea between, behind this log reduction targets and the approach of kind of identifying treatment targets for um, pathogens is that you don't then need to monitor surrogate organisms or surrogate parameters a lot. You you develop these treatment systems that are are safe. So for for roof runoff, it would probably be something there would need to be a barrier for the protozoa, like some kind of filter. Um, even a cartridge filter would be okay, and then something like ultraviolet to make sure the bacteria are inactivated. So that would be probably the kind of treatment scheme that would be make sense based on the treatment targets um, that we identified, and then just making sure that those those systems are functioning, are up, maintained well, and operating, and all those kinds of things would be sufficient to ensure that the treatment is is happening in the way it should without having to monitor surrogate organisms or things like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alan, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, this is great, Sybil. So it's really cool to see, to see this come to fruition. Um, I, well, so two quick questions. One is, do you have repeat samples from roofs so that you can get some idea of whether, whether there are some roots, you know, whether, whether there are some roofs are, I think you might have already answered this, but um, yeah, it, you know, like if I've tested my roof once and it's okay, I don't have to worry about it because I have a clean roof. Or, or do you think there's temporal variation that needs there's to... absolutely temporal variation? There's variation in everything, and we did so. We did have each roof had at least um, four samples collected mm -hmm. from it. Some of them even more, um, and there was just nothing consistent. It was in. Mm -hmm things that you would think like, oh, over the summer and there's a lot of debris on the roof at this sampling time. So I think there's going to be a lot of, back of of potentially pathogens. And then we wouldn't get hits. And then mm -hmm. sometime in the middle of winter, you'd get a hit that you just totally don't expect. And, and mm -hmm. that was that's what makes it kind of difficult, honestly, to manage is because there's not really good predictors. And it is, there's temporal and spatial variation that occurs mm -hmm. in, in the quality. And you have just enough detections, so you can't just say we don't have to worry about it, right? But That's the problem. To, yeah. So that, then my other question um, is: so, so the citizen science world, even since we started our discussions about citizen science like eight years ago, whenever you and right was starting, um, the citizen science world has like exploded, and it's not even citizen yeah. science anymore. It's community science, and it's participatory science, and it's are 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 you a happy part of that community or was this a was this a one like I'm just curious personally or any people in your team um, really kind of bit the citizen science bullet in your or buck you know are you sticking with it or or yeah that's a great question Alan and I let's hear from Jennifer after me but um I loved citizen science project and I would love to find another way that it fits with my research. Um, I've stayed engaged with Greg Newman and his group and he's doing a lot here at CSU to try to grow citizen science and he's hold, hosting various events and things like that 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 are kind of promoting citizen science across the the, the across our um, research institute across CSU. I try to let other people I think a lot of reason that they don't happen sometimes is because 
researchers don't think of it as a possible option and they wonder if your paper will be published if if you engage in this kind of activity and things like that so i've done my part to try to communicate and i hope that i get another opportunity where i have a research question where citizen science can help me answer i would certainly love to engage in more projects and look for opportunities to do that but you have to have the right research question right team all of those things jennifer so, i think i think the same i i i really enjoyed it a lot i think part of it is that qa qc part um, so that we can be confident in the data that we can collect and i think that partnerships are absolutely critical um, when we went out, I mean, I've been out to see a lot with students and I know how to make them do what I need them to do so I can collect the data. Um, but working with the Earthwatch people was really helpful um, and really how to, how to keep the students, um, the citizen scientists engaged. But I, I mean, we need more data and we're gonna have to figure out how to do this. And so I would definitely engage in more citizen science projects. Again, if it was the right question and 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 it's so long as it was funded, because we did ours pretty much for free, right, Alan? Um, I'd like to be paid. <laughs> um, okay, because as a typical scientist, we don't get paid, but we did get the data, which is really great. But I think it's absolutely critical to our, for the stuff that we did, I think it's critical to the municipalities. That they, that they have to start using, they have to figure out how they're gonna monitor um, GI systems um, so that we can keep these bright spots in our cities and they don't go away. And, um, you know, I just love the, the rooftop stuff too, Sybil, because I always think about in New York, you know, you could capture the roof runoff, but all the birds and the pigeons are up there. And I was really surprised that you didn't see that. In Miami, I would think there'd be a lot of birds. Um, Tucson was not surprising to me. Everything's baked out. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in the city, we're gonna have to be reusing our water because our CSO systems aren't gonna be able to handle the volumes of water anymore. So it'd be mm -hmm. nice to know that we can use it safely for fit for purpose reuse. And I think this point Jennifer brought up about funding is important because trying to conduct one of these projects without the proper resource to engage people like Greg Newman and Alicia Crawl in our project and the different, uh, Jennifer noted Earthwatch, we uh, had, um, it's the RAIN project that's around here. Anyway, we, th there were so many people that engaged in this and if we didn't have the right funding to support them, we couldn't have been successful in the project. So it's they've got to be funded to the level that that supports people to really help with participant communications and things. Yeah, and I would just add one other thing to one thing that I think was lacking in the beginning of ours, because you had people coming in with different disciplines and different expertise, is that I think that some time really needs to be spent kind of creating the internal part of the flame so we can all get on the same page with you know, what it is that we need, um, because I don't, I think that we were battling it out a lot with oh, really? our partners in, in not in a bad way, but there was just, we needed to spend that initial time getting on mm -hmm. the same page so that, you know, we weren't relegated to just being the scientists that we actually knew how to teach to and to make it relevant. Um, but, but then again, we need to understand what it is that Earthwatch and all of our different partners needed so that we could all have the shared vision. Um, our project was for all of us. You know, they they were, in a way, our, our project was like, they wanted to plug in the citizen science thing into something that had a lot more agendas than just collecting data about the GIs. And, you know, I think, um, right, they, they the Earthwatch and the bank had a thing going on for years before they shifted over to citizen science. And, and they wanted to see if citizen science was kind of an engaging, motivational, but modular thing that they could stick into this day that they had planned for their participants with other agendas, like getting the participants to be excited about the bank's sustainability goals, which some right. of which didn't really have anything to do with green infrastructure. Yeah, it ended so, up being a bit of a battle because Earthwatch yeah. wanted to be refunded, which I totally yeah. get. So um, was, yeah, so, but I think that, that there, there needs to be some more mechanisms to really yeah. make this happen. Because funding yeah. is, you know, if you're not tenacious, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, like, like I think all of us were, I don't, I don't think that um, it would have happened. <laughs> you have to be paid. You can't be scientists with this. Yeah. I really think um, I like this discussion and I really hope we can continue it uh, at the annual meeting, something to put a pin in for yeah. kind of next steps, UN 
seven or whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever iteration we're going to be on. But, Actually, you know, Sarah, since, you know I, I got to run, but if you, yeah. if you want to in that, in the, in your thinking about that, I think it'd be worth kind of, and I'm willing to do this to circle back to some of the, the early group that was involved in talking about this that didn't end up in on one of these projects like Daryl Jinrad and mm -hmm. other folks. And because I think there's some wisdom and, and even, you know, maybe involving the, the, um, the Earthwatch, um, like bringing them into the discussion in some way, I'm not saying flying them to the meeting, but if there's a way to, I think there might be some, some yeah. interesting next step kind of discussions. I, I gotta go folks, so I'm gonna sign off. Um, yep. Everybody does. Thanks so much, guys. It was thank you. That was fun. About your work. Yeah. yeah. Take Thanks. care. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.